I'm Audrey Shepley. I'm the director of the American Library in Paris. Welcome to Evenings with an Author, sponsored by Grow at Annenberg. Tonight is a very special evening with an author. Um, first of all, we're welcoming, finally, Robert McCrum, and it's a night of McCrums. I know that Alice is familiar to our audience, and we have two generations of McCrums, two formidable minds, father and daughter, and they'll be in conversation about Robert's new book, Shakespearean. As you approach his work, it's like you're stepping into this great cathedral of words, ideas, and language. And in that cathedral, you find, as you just said, this extraordinary body of greatness. I mean, it, it is very daunting. You're preceded by Milton. You didn't mention Milton. Um, Dryden. And then all the, 18th, the great 18th century Pope, Johnson. Mm on and on and on and then in the, then all the romantics keats coleridge right so Wordsworth. so what, what else is there to say so everything has been said and what else is there to say um but at, but at the same time you're then drawn back to shakespeare himself who is a very modest sim, he's a very he's 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 uncomplicated and very complicated he had a very democratic view about art. He believed that ordinary people could, could, could come to, could, he, he was a great believer in the audiences, mm. the common man and woman. Mm. And I think he would be very hospitable to the idea of somebody coming into this cathedral with their own mm. inadequacies mm. and responding to what he's, what he wants to say. All his, almost all his plays end with some kind of epilogue. Almost all the plays end with an epilogue which thanks the audience refers to the audience, uh, audience as gentles. Um, he's very responsive to the idea of pleasing his people who come to watch his plays. At the end of Midsummer Night's Dream, Puck says, if we shadows have offended, think but this and all is mended. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on and, and then he ends up by saying, let us be friends, give, give me your hands if we be friends. Shakespeare always wants to meet the audience halfway. Mm. He wants to please the audience. He wants to grab the audience's attention. Mm. I think the English, I know the English, the English literary scene, and so do you, um, the English and the American literary scene, it can be very, very high flown and quite intimidating. Mm. Shakespeare is at least high flown, well, he's very high flown, but the least intimidating kind of writer. Mm. He'd, he'd, be in the, he'd be sitting at the back there with his notebook. He's probably come from doing a rehearsal of, of a new play. He's on the, way, on the way home to his lodging to finish off a sonnet. I mean, he's always working. He's always observing. He wasn't, as somebody said, a company keeper. He was a man of the theater. He was an artist. Um, but he was an artist before the idea of the artist was really a, a concept. It's really interesting. His name was not known. Um, and, and he didn't really care about how his name was written. He, he right? appears not, well, no one did in those days, mm. in the 1500s. And he's also alive at a fascinating moment. I mean, we're living through this extraordinary period of, of intense disruption and chaos. And I think history is often, often has these hinge moments. And this is a hinge moment. And Shakespeare, Shakespeare, in very simple terms, he was born in 1564 and came of age around the time of the Spanish Armada. And then had approximately a decade working in the theater in London and also writing poetry and, and working in the last decade of the great Queen Elizabeth I's reign. So that's, that's the first half of his life, creative life. The second half of his creative life running from roughly 1600, rough, roughly Hamlet, was under a different regime, James I, we can come on to that a bit later on possibly, different regime, different climate, and what, what we call the Jacobean period under James, but the Scottish king being the new king and so forth. And when you look at a period of intense change, and when you look back on those two decades, you see it, it's a hinge in, our understanding, or oh, well, certainly of English life. Um, uh, let me speak about English life. I mean, it's probably, it would have been true of French, but so, 
that the Shakespeare, Shakespeare's world of the 1590s, that first decade, is a world wholly foreign in every way, in medicine, politics, education, everything is different. It was a world of magic, barbarity. God. <laughs> Second decade. <laughs> it's a world which you would all, all understand. It's, it's just, just like that. Under James I. Under James I. Mm. So from 1600 to 1610, it's, the big, I wouldn't, it's, it's becoming much more available to, to us, and it's becoming a, a world we, we, all, we all sort of know about. Um, the English language is, the people are no longer using Latin in the way that they were before. Um, medicine is becoming, med medicine we would understand, money is becoming the money we would understand, politics is becoming more democratic. The idea of, of the, the popular voice being expressed through, through, the, the, through, the, through the parliament and so forth. And then you're very quickly into the, in the Civil War and then you're into a world which is completely familiar. The, the, the houses become different as well. Um, they have windows that with glass in them. <laughs> I mean, for example. For example. <laughs> um, and I think we have to be conscious that the Shakespeare we're talking about is somebody who is both very strange and very familiar. Mm. And I put those two things side by side mm -hmm. because I think a lot of the confusion and the problems that we have when we talk about Shakespeare is that we don't recognize this duality. And he's there's a real duality. He's both a mystic figure and a mysterious figure and also one of us mm. and i want part of to go back this is a very long answer to your first question i can say that i wrote this book to make him one of us mm. Mm. Uh, i can to make him somebody who is not intimidating is and i can i can demonstrate this very simply um he's um people always say he's impossible to understand he's not impossible to understand he he'd be appalled at that, that suggestion because mm. he, his job he would see was to would be to come in raise the curtain well there were, were no curtains mm. start the play in the most arresting way he could think mm. and hold the audience by the scruff of the neck for two hours mm. so so one of your projects then responding to your answer is is to break open eclectic works for the average reader was, yeah for who who for you was there was there a critic or a journalist, or your experience as playing a fairy in *Midsummer Night's Dream*. What broke Shakespeare open a for crucial, you? Crucial role. A crucial <laughs> moment in your in your childhood. <laughs> First fairy in *Midsummer Night's Dream* is very the, over hill, over dale, over. I could give you the whole thing. It's one speech. It's a very important speech because it introduces the park. <laughs> it's a very, it was a very important speech because I played it. <laughs> I played it in green tights, age thirteen. I've never looked back. Um, <laughs> When, when did, what or who broke open Shakespeare for you, Robert? Mm. I think it was an accumulation, I think it's something that kind of creeps up on you in a way. I remember, remember when you were nine, I remember taking you to Midsummer Night's Dream myself actually in London, you've probably forgotten, but I took you to see I you. Remember. Yeah, you. We went to see it together. Um, and I just begin to become quite, obsessed. I think it's, it's something, it, he's a subject with, with which you can become quite obsessed. So you be, what, is that and when so you... this is a kind of the fruit of an obsession in a way, mm -hmm. and also I describe in the book how I'd grown up in Cambridge, in the shadow or under of Mo of Marlowe, mm. Christopher Marlowe, and mm. we mustn't overlook Christopher Marlowe. He's a very very important. My college is Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, and it was Marlowe's college. And in the college, so there's, it's there to this day. There's a a, a, an alleged portrait we don't know whether it is Marlowe but, but this portrait was discovered when I was one years old and it was brought to my dad who is the, the, the figure the character called the senior tutor in the college and these two bits of wood which were um, just two bits of wood found in the skip were, were, were cleaned up and discovered to be the, it's the, it's the famous portrait of Christopher Marlowe so I grew up with this, the story of, of this doomed youth who was the alumnus of this college. But Marlowe is very important because he is an exact contemporary. He was, he was born in 1564. He came of artisan stock, Shakespeare artisan stock in Stratford, English country town, Marlowe artisan stock in Canterbury, Southern English country town. Um, Shakespeare's father was a leather worker, a cobbler. Marlowe's father was a butcher. So they're very, very similar. 
of the same age, same background, except Marlowe went to Cambridge and Shakespeare didn't go to university and was a Stratford boy. So Shakespeare is the, is the outlier and Marlowe becomes this huge figure on the London, it really invented the Elizabethan theatre. And, so, and certainly a huge figure for Shakespeare starting out as absolutely. a young playwright, very intimidating, very tiring. Talk about the importance of Marlowe's death then for him. So the theatre in late 16th century London, it was, it was the movies, it was Netflix, it was books, it was Radio 4, it was everything. What would Shakespeare be doing now? He'd be, he'd be, he'd be writing scripts, of course. Or poetry for the for the stage. Well, certainly for the stage, the movie. Ever, he'd be doing box sets. I mean, you mm. name it. Mm. He'd be very much in demand, of course. Mm. He's fake. <laughs> um, but it, I want to pay tribute to Mar Marlowe because he he gets forgotten because he he was murdered, as you all know, in a so-called tavern brawl in fifteen ninety-three. If Shakespeare had died in fifteen ninety-three, we'd only know him as a poet. Mm. He'd be, he'd be known as a poet who wrote a couple of rather odd plays um, and was, had, had not reached his maturity. And so part of what this book is about is, is part of, is where I begin is about, the, to go, also to go back to your opening, but is about the, I'm very interested, having lived my life in the, in the literary world, I'm very interested in the vicissitudes of literary fame which are very chancy and very strange. Yeah, this is great um, because I think my opening question, I wanted to, to, to pinch you as we started to say, what could you possibly say about Shakespeare given that so much has already been said? And I think um, now having read your book this weekend, um, it seems to me that your gaze as a former publisher, as the head of Faber and Faber for 20 years, as Audrey mentioned, so with I your eye for emerging and inchoate Brilliance, that's what for me um, provided new insight into the collective works. And you write, Robert, Shakespeare is to most a genius, to some a god. Yet the trajectory of his life and work follows the path of many less exalted literary artists. Implausible as this might sound, after career in the word of print, there's a pattern I can relate to here. I know how, like hearing a great new melody for the first time, the unique timbre of an original voice, the thrill of the new is always a moment of magic. When does Shakespeare find his original voice for you? It's a very, very good, interesting question. Um, the, he, he, find, he, he, he goes on finding his voice, um, but I want, in answer to the question, also to bring it to something which we all know about, to bring you to the first night of Hamlet in the Globe, in sometime in 1599, we don't know quite when it was, but, but um, first night of Hamlet. Um, and that, that's a turning point, it's all about hinge moments, that's a turning point in, in was, it's the first time, and it, Shakespeare's been building up to this, it's the first time in his work, life as a dramatist that he's managed to put, he, he, he brings off in a sensationally brilliant way the idea of self-consciousness on stage. Never before so explicitly had, a, had the protagonist of a play walked to the front of the stage and said, to be or not to be, that is the question. 